Okay, well, welcome everyone to the uh, City of Santa Rosa Cultural Heritage Board meeting, um, September 13th. Um, we'll start out with um, a call to order and roll call. Uh, okay. Uh, board Member Boren? Here. Board Member Carney? Here. Board Member Fennell? Here. Board Member Klein? Here. Board Member Marslin? Here. Vice Chair Garrett is currently absent, but will be here shortly. Chair Muser? Here. Let the record reflect that all board members are present with uh, Vice Chair Garrett showing up late. Thank you. Okay, moving on to board business. Uh, our statement of purpose, the principal duties of the board include undertaking and updating historic inventories or surveys recommending designation of landmarks and preservation districts, reviewing proposed alterations to historic buildings, and promoting public awareness of preservation issues. If you are in a historic district, would like more information regarding historic districts, please see the process and review procedures for owners of historic properties. Um, real quickly, if we could open up for public comment on that. Uh, we do not have any attendees via Zoom and nobody in person. Okay, we'll close public comment. Before we move to item three, what do you think about um, board member reports? Were we going to do that at all? I don't think we're doing anything except this, except the item for the special meeting. Okay. And then, and we'll. Ask so no, no report from Miss Murray, either. Oh no, I don't. On I don't. I don't. Plea of works study uh, session. I have no reports. Okay. I do not at this meeting, but I, okay. I will have a, a report for the next meeting. Okay. The special meetings, because people aren't aware of them as much. Okay. So. I got it. I, I apologize for interrupting everyone. No. <laughs> just started. Okay, moving on to item three, scheduled items. Uh, and uh, this is a report, City of Santa Rosa, Resilient City Changes 2023, file number PRJ23-010, and background of City of Santa Rosa Zoning Code text amendment and a zoning map amendment for the resilient uh, city uh, changes. And um, our presenter, our City planner presenter today is Christian Candelaria. <laughs> Thank you. It's all yours. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen really quickly. And I, I will warn you, I'm, I'm unfortunately hard of hearing. So okay. the more you could speak up, the more it would be appreciated. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Um, today we'll be discussing the Resilient City Combining District update. This is going to be talking about a few things related to Resilient City that we have currently in the city. Um, and we have certain measures for rebuilding um, from disasters that were in place starting in 2018 and we're looking at changes by the end of the year. Um, so currently we're looking at modifying our Resilient City Code section regarding a Resilient City Combining District. This currently is not within the historic Combining District whatsoever because uh, these were adopted in response to the tubs, nuns, and glass fires. Um, these are set to expire on December 31st, 2023, unless amended by council. And these were created to address the reconstruction, repair, rebuilding, and damaged parcels um, from those disasters. Um, this is also utilized alongside what we have as the resilient city development measures as well. So our project goals for this process and also coming here is to do permit streamlining to facilitate reconstruction um, for any cat catastrophic events and then avoid any type of bottleneck during the permitting process. Um, and reducing the review for any type of expedited review. So that would be re, um, reducing any level of, if maybe a permit has to come to the CHB, maybe it's reduced to the zoning administrator or to the staff level with the director review. 
So currently here has been our project timeline for the resilient city changes. Uh, we've gone through originally with city department feedback sessions in April and August. And then after that, we reached out to a few developers about our design review process. And then we conducted a public survey about both of our resilient city um, ordinances. And then we went to the design review board for proposed changes that were pertain to design review. And then today is for cultural heritage board. Uh, next, we're bringing the entire project to planning commission for a recommendation to city council. And then we will be going to city council in November, which would lead to the ordinance being adopted in December. Uh, we are currently looking at a uh, permit streamlining for landmark alteration. Um, this would be only be applicable to properties that are affected by any type of hazard in the city. We're currently working on that language right now for the upcoming ordinance changes. Um, this would also help with reducing the process and time for rebuilding. Um, currently, we have only gone through this process for hillside development and design review. So for areas that were affected by the fire, they had um, Originally, I would be going to the zoning administrator or maybe even to the design review board for reviews for hillside development and design review, but our current resilient city measures reduce that to either zoning administrator level or to staff level to review these projects. Um, this happened, that's still currently happening. Um, that's because the ordinance is ending soon. And uh, moving forward, we're looking at making this process available for any natural disaster that happens in the city. So that's why we wanted to come to the cultural heritage board because that is a huge area of the city that could possibly be affected in the future. Um, we're also looking at uh, no longer tying this to a specific zone. So we're looking at no longer using the um, RC combining district, but rather implementing it citywide so it doesn't have to go through any rezoning process with the city council. Um, we have a few proposals to bring forward regarding resilient um, city landmark alteration processes. So the few of them that you can see here um, that I have listed for different types of projects. So uh, separated between residential and non-residential. So we are giving you an idea about um, the residential project process. This would be reducing any type of rebuilding measures to just concept with the CHB and then going straight into the building permit process. Um, another uh, another thing would be going for residential projects, going from CHB to zoning administrator. And then some findings they would need to cover would be listed under architectural compatibility. So that is color, materials and pattern, architectural features, and as well as district character. And then also thinking um, about the damaged structures themselves that are considered historic, um, looking at how those might be documented in any way or incorporated into the process. So that would be photo documentation in case these buildings might need to be taken down and we don't want to lose them forever. So maybe we would have the property owner. Property owner have a photo documentation of whatever's left of the structure. Um, restoration would be if maybe only a small portion of a structure is damaged. They can rebuild it or fix it or repair it and wouldn't need to go through as much measures and it would still be a part of the entire structure. Incorporation would be maybe the entire structure or a majority of the structure has been damaged, but there's still like a wall or few, a few up or any, or any other determining factor. Um, and then that's incorporated into a new design with the district character. And then also looking at possible historic report or historic evaluation for these projects to ensure they're still following our standards for um, historic preservation. Um, another thing to go over is that um, we have planned developments within the city. So these are areas within the city that kind of have their own type of zoning within the policy document. Um, these are created to, there's a variety of reasons of why things are planned developments. They generally have their own standards because of specific reasons at the time when they were developed. Um, a large majority of the parcels within historic districts are planned developments, so they have their own specific standards for those as well. Um, we currently have a specific section in the RC zoning code that allows plan developments to go through different standards, uh, but that will be being updated in the future so to make it more clear of how these standards are going to be placed. And then lastly, it's recommended by the Planning and Economic Development Department that the Cultural Heritage Board provide comments and recommendations to staff about the proposed landmark alteration permit streamlining and the upcoming Resilient Cities Zoning Code text and map amendments. Um, my information is listed here. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. I, um, I've given this subject quite a bit of thought this last week and um, trying to think about a way that um, uh, the board could be the most productive in giving you information that's going to go on then to um, the planning commission. And I'm assuming the planning commission then will have a draft that they'll yes. actually review and yes. approve. Um, so because we didn't really have kind of a, a, a draft of ideas, I drafted something up and if, if everybody's okay with it, I'd like to just so that it goes on public record, maybe go ahead and read it. Mm -hmm. And I think that might add to creating some discussion of our board as to you know what what things we might want to consider or think about to be forwarded on to the planning commission um you good with that Ms. Murray? i am I'm, we're trying to bring it up so we can have it on the screen while while you're you're going through it and so members of the public can you follow can with the yellow ball along <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> Okay, yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to, but if anybody's watching it on Zoom. And then um, towards the end of our discussion, I'll, I will open this up for public comment if there's anybody in the public. So, anyway, I kind of handed this out to everybody. Um, it's also was listed as late correspondence um, on an email to you that came out today. Um, and I just titled it Major Disaster Properties Located in H Combining Districts. And for some of the new board members, uh, it, you may already know this, but in case you don't, any um, area that's a been designated a historic neighborhood um, has been identified on the zoning map, and it gets a dash H after the properties on it. Ms. Murray, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And so that's what kind of makes the neighborhood uh, identified specifically and those properties with with the dash so whatever they their zoning was they get this addition dash h to it so they call it a dash h combining district <clears throat> the purpose of this document is to generate discussion around policy needs should a major disaster such as fire earthquake or flood occur in a historic neighborhood the disaster would involve the entire if the, but the disaster could involve the entire district, partial district, or selected properties. Because changes to contributing structures within historic districts require either a minor or major landmark alteration permit, this document attempts to address the rebuilding needs of a historic district should it be impacted by a major disaster. So I kind of broke down some different scenarios. So the first scenario is a historic district with a major loss of structures identified as historic contributors. So uh, should the percentage of lost contributing structures be greater than the number required to originally create the historic district, the following action shall be taken. And I'm, I think I've read somewhere, I couldn't find it, that when a historic district is created, a survey is done, and there's a count basically made of contributing structures versus non-contributing structures. And if there's enough contributing structures, it makes it a historic neighborhood. So in this first scenario, if we had a loss of so many of those contributing structures, uh, that was greater than really what was required to be. So a couple of options. Uh, first option, zoning map amendment. After a survey of the affected area, a modification of the affected historic neighborhoods zoning map could preserve um, the historic district, albeit smaller, while allowing rebuilding of law structures under the provisions of 2028-100. That's the, the dash RC document that, that we saw. Uh, the second option, removing historic district designation. After a survey of the affected area, removal of historic district des designation would occur if the loss of contributing structures is so significant that exceeds the number originally needed to create the historic district and geographic location of the loss 
uh, would make it impossible to adjust the zoning map for the affected historic district. Rebuilding would then proceed under the provisions of 2028. There, so those those are you know two two different things. One one is we just redraw the map, and actually we wouldn't be able to. We would recommend to the planning commission to recommend to the city council to redraw the map. Or if there was so much loss, like what you know happened in Hawaii, you know then it's it's really no longer a historic district. It's it's all been lost. Okay, two, um, historic district with minor loss of structures deemed as historic contributors. Total destruction of contributing historic structure, the rebuilding of a totally destroyed structure within a historic district would be treated in the same manner as building on a vacant lot within a historic district, therefore requiring major landmark alteration permit. The new structure would need to comply with the identifying characteristics of the historic neighborhood. And this will be an area for discussion for us is do we really need to require a major landmark alteration permit or could we do some of the things that are being suggested as far as having the zoning administrator handle the review of that or just after concept review, just forward it on for, to building permit. Um, B is partial destruction of contributing historic structure. The repair or rebuilding of a partially damaged structure within a historic district should be done in a manner to repair the structure to its original design. And again, if, if they were going to do it to its original design, that might be something that concept review, then straight on to, to permit process. Or we could stay with uh, as it is now, requiring a major landmark alteration permit, especially if they're going to be making changes uh, in the rebuild process. And then the third item is kind of a combination of both. So you have a fire that maybe took out one of the streets or one of the area, but you have pockets within the historic district, but there's still enough left in the historic district for it to remain intact. So you might have a uh, rezoning map in our map rezoning the neighborhood as well as um, these pockets of damaged or completely burnt down structures. Uh, four major and minor landmark alteration permit requirements. Uh, all fees associated with major and minor landmark alteration permits uh, shall be waived. Losses of historic Districts designated as a dash RC combining district shall receive expedited review by the CHB through the process of holding special meetings as needed. And I would think that if we had a situation like this where we had a major disaster water, we should be available to, to meet as often and as frequently as needed under a special meeting context to get things, keep things rolling. Um, Historic properties could be repaired in the same manner as they were built, would be done so with a minor landmark alteration permit. New structures to be built within this historic district would require a major landmark alteration permit. Uh, five, removing historic designation and zoning map amendments to historic neighborhood designations. Um, a detailed survey of the historic district shall be conducted to determine the extent of damage and loss to the historic district. The CHB should receive a recommendation for removing historic designation or amending the zoning map associated with the historic district. The CHB should provide comment to the Planning Commission if it is believed that the historic district designation should be removed or the zoning map for the district changed. And CHB special meetings shall be conducted to expedite the review process. And then finally, additional considerations due to the additional complexities associated with historic districts. And what makes this different than even the hillside or coffee park is that H designation. Because maybe the hillside was complicated because of building on a hill but the historic districts are complicated because they're collectively a historic element. And so 
I think it, I, I feel that this new zoning language that the historic um, element needs its its own uh, section, you know, so. Um, so anyway, it is recommended the PED assign a single staff member who would be responsible for performing a post-incident survey of the affected historic structures and oversee the rebuilding process. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna jump back to staff or the other board members if they have comments or thoughts or clarification on well what percentage would you say that it, it would have to be the buildings would be room total or whatever to take away that designation of historic is like is there going to be like a percentage point 25 percent of the buildings 50 percent or how many how many buildings were required at the time to make an an historic district so yeah i have 75 percent are burned it would lose its designation as a historic district, I would think. Yeah, I would I would think we would go back to the original um, survey that was done. I don't know. Review, review. I don't know how I don't know because that there, there was, was a number of yeah, percentage. Yeah. I don't know. I know that we have we have our preservation districts. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of properties outside those preservation districts that also are historic. Um, yeah. that don't have need protection. Consideration too. Yeah. yeah, and so, so, but, but I think, uh, I think, yeah, I, I ultimately, I, I'm sure concentration would play a role. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it would be the city council making that decision. So, w whether or not it's a preservation, but presumably, district. that would be on the recommendation of the CHP. Yeah, yes, and it, that's the local designation. There are other, there, there are other designations, there's state and federal as well. So, but if you look at the federal, I read through all the federal information on the rebuild, and I think this is pretty right on in terms of the federal um, and, and what our purview is. Um, I would, I mean, there are a couple of minor things I'd change in this. Like, if you built on a vacant lot, like the one on McDonald Avenue, did they have to get a major landmark alteration just to build a brand new building on the lot? Yes. Yeah, okay. So that's one question. And then um, I, I think we should clarify what the identifying characteristics of the historic what we mean by that. And what I've always assumed from our local guidelines and the federal guidelines is that you, that is the um, pattern of the fenestration of those buildings and the pattern of the roof pitch and the materials used, but that um, preferably the building be easily distinguished from the historic buildings. So in other words, like they've done in London to build a glass and steel building in an historic district is appropriate if the fenestration and the roof pitches are similar to the other um, buildings in that neighborhood. And I think that's always been an issue in Santa Rosa talking these through, but um, I'd like to see some language like that added to this. Um, and I don't know how you, I mean, I think this, this, how do you, no, down on two part B, if you're repairing an historic building, uh, how do you differentiate between the repair and the original building, which you'd have to do? Mm -hmm. My questions. <laughs> well, my if, question. that's, if that's a repair, in other words, um, you're going to because your siding material has lived out its life. And so you're going to replace the siding material. You would want, we, we would want the siding material to match the original siding material because it's being repaired. If you're doing an addition um, to the, uh, 
original structure. I think that's when the Secretary of Interior talks about differentiating something, something uh, that would look that would blend, complement, but but stand out itself as as this was added on or this was the addition. I, there, that's problematic because, for instance, my house that I used to live in, that siding is not made. So you have, you have it made. <laughs> you have yeah. to have it made. And do, is that something you want to require of Burbank District? Yeah, and, and you know, and that's that's why I kind of feel that the processes that we see these are all discussions we would have if it were coming to the board and decisions that would be made if it was coming to the board. And I know we want to expedite the process. And, but at the same time too, if the historic district has remained intact, there's also an obligation to the remaining property owners within that historic district. And that's the reason why we have the major landmark alteration process and the minor landmark alteration process is to um, have an opportunity for us to discuss those things as well as open it up for public comment and public feedback from other neighbors and things as to how they feel about the design of that building. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a uh, one end, we want to rush it through or get it going, but on the other end, we also want to take in consideration that this is a historic neighborhood and, and possibly we still need to keep some of our processes in time. I think the goal of, the, um, of this is to streamline process. So we've talked in previous meetings about getting before the, the Cultural Heritage Board through the concept design review, which Chair Muser mentioned in his, his discussion, I don't think it's here, but um, where, and that's something that, that we can get pretty quick. We could, uh, one of the problems with where that can be problematic is um, with signage and the noticing process. And we could, you know, possibly look at that and ease up the noticing so neighbors are still getting noticed but um, that, that concept design review process gets it onto an agenda with zero staff analysis. It gets it on the agenda with a memo, and that way the board can review the plans and make recommendations. Okay, and then moving into the next phase, say, you know, if they were to um, follow all of those recommendations or get, a, or get a report from a qualified professional that supports otherwise, maybe something, a compromise there, that they could go straight to building permit four. I think um, I think with the rebuild, I think we went I think we went back to if it was major, it went to minor, and if it went to minor, it went to director. I think I don't know if that's how we did it at the get-go. For uh, like hillside, like hillside no, the hillside was uh, delegated down to director all the way, even for commercial. I, don't I think it says for processes that would go to commission, it would go to ZA. I don't know if that was original, but yes. So, so, but those are some ideas. I mean, what we did before, I mean, you can see in that, that ordinance that was provided as an attachment to the memo is that it, it took things that were major projects and bumped it way down and it took items that were minor projects and gave them to, to director level. The process was intended to be very expeditious to get whether it's one person or 3,000 people that have lost their homes, the goal is to get them back in the home very quickly. And I completely agree that the, but so understand that that's, that's when it's going to occur for somebody who has a, 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 a when their home has been demolished. Which um, could easily yeah. happen. I yeah. mean, you think about it, if, mm -hmm. if the fire started you know, wherever in Fountain Grove and burned down through Hidden Valley and, and through the Proctor neighborhood, it would take out McDonald. It would probably flip over to Cherry Street and then to Burbank. And then, you know, I mean, it, if it's that big a fire, I mean, it could burn a huge amount in the city because all those buildings are wood, almost all of them. 
I mean, very few stucco buildings. Mm -hmm. And um, in that, you'd have the high school, which, although it's not designated, that's one of the most historic buildings in the city. Um, you'd have a whole lot of other um, major landmarks for the city. Mm -hmm. So I do think it would have to be expedited because how would, if you're trying to get it done quickly, how do you get it done? Well, that's, and, I, and I think that's why there should be language that gives opportunity to undesignate a historic neighborhood, and that would free up mm -hmm. um, if, if there was so much damage, if, if, if the council was able to very quickly undesignate a historic neighborhood, then you could fall back to um, whatever you the have building there building. without yeah. or the zoning zone. without that. Yeah. Standard. Yeah, and, and as well as a language that would allow um, remapping if you had like just a street or, or, or an area. Because, it, like I say, the reality is, is what makes it is the structures. And if the structures are gone, even if you built them back as close as you could, they're still not, they're not and con should. contributors should. anymore. And it shouldn't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, but if there is a building that is of value that's still standing, that building should be treated under the historic code. Like, yeah. So, for instance, the McDonald Mansion. Um, if that were to be left standing, that should not be raised just yeah. because the rest of the district's gone. Um, something else, you know, we, we do in our accessory dwelling unit ordinance, we give we give people an op option to provide, you know, design it, the second unit like this, you know, and uh, matching, um, you know, the, the siding materials, color, types of windows and what have you, or provide a, um, a report from a qualified historian or you know, that we have to leave it up to you to figure out who's qualified to do that report. <laughs> but but um, and as an alternative of going for a landmark alteration, a minor landmark alteration, that the, the, they provide that report. And, and, you know, we look it over. If we've got questions, we know who to ask. But, but that's an option. You're, you're going to have people in a catastrophic event with a lot of loss. You're going to have people to do things that you don't want them to do, right? But generally speaking, people do the right thing. And giving them, I mean, really the goal here is to make it as easy as possible for them. Um, so think, think, even I'm encouraging you to think outside the LMA process. Um, maybe that, that report could, you know, after review, if it meets certain standards, and you can, you can advise us on those standards, where if they meet all those standards, that um, that they go straight to building. Them. So, food for thought. Um, just, I'm just so it, seems, to it. it seems like our discussion is kind of coming down to what do we want to do as far as the major landmark alteration permit requirement in the case of a major disaster, and do we want to um allow for concept review only and then either the, the zoning and I, th I think it should at least go to a zoning administrator or not just go direct to permit on a major you know mm -hmm. reduction under the circumstance of or do we want to maintain the requirement of a major landmark alteration permit, but maybe figure out a way to be able to fast track it a little bit more. Am I just that? So, and when it's to give a, some context to that, when a major landmark alteration comes into the city, or a minor for that matter, we don't, it's not just planning staff that reviews that permit. It goes through our building, our engineering, our water, you have fire department, everybody gets, Six so it's not, plans. it's not, it's <laughs> not. It's, tough to expedite that and it's even tougher to expedite a hundred of them let alone right. I know we've already seen 3,000 and in that case 
we hired a, or we brought on an independent permitting staff and there were mistakes made. Standards were not followed, but we got those homes built. And in the end, I think that even where those mistakes were made, it was a really good thing over in Co Coffee Park. I think Coffee Park has really turned out nicely, you know, for the most part. But, but so, I mean, again, the, the goal, I, I'm assuming, I'm not talking about it, but I think the goal is really to make this as expeditious as possible. And I don't think it would be reasonable to ask the board to be here seven days a week with the plants. You know, so, so, I mean, really that, depending on maybe the amount of destruction, if it's co a complete destruction and the two homes next to it have all, you know, the other properties flanking it have also been destroyed, um, maybe at that point it doesn't require, you know, so I, I'm just throwing out ideas, but we're looking for that kind of suggestions from you. Um, and I think, can those suggestions come in after this meeting via email? Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to take any suggestions uh, here today and then via email to Christian. Um, you know, the only caveat we have is our timeline. Um, and we are moving quickly. And that's just because this the both Resilient City sections expire at the end of this year. Um, and we want to make sure that these provisions are in place um, before the expiration. Um, so, yes, I think we can definitely take comments um, prior to uh, the plan and our deadlines here pretty soon. Another thought I was having um, to muddy the waters, just because you know, that's what we like to do. Uh, you know, this is a, what we're taking forward to the Planning Commission and Council is codification of the resiliency development measures that were developed and have been updated periodically since 2017. Um, and so we're dealing with existing code language that we're putting into sections that make sense and modifying as needed. This is creating something new that wasn't in there. And it wasn't in there because the just, you know, the, the, uh, the calamities that we have had have an impacted preservation district, right? Um, so another thought could be if this is more complex than we can do in this short period of time, um, you know, we might be able to say, uh, you know, let the council know that, you know, we also want to address preservation districts in this, um, but it's more complex and we're gonna come back. I know that you want to <laughs> move on to other things, but um, you know, just to give it more time, and then we can so we can move forward with what we have and amend that section uh, later. It's just another thought. Are there national guidelines for like FEMA? I know Mark DeBacher worked for FEMA for a while on, and went to disasters and made instant decisions on things, would it be worth consulting with Mark to find out how, um, you know, how they, if they had any guidelines for those decisions? We have city staff that have been over helping with the Lahaina um, fires, and mm -hmm. that was a lot, and FEMA's a lot of it. I, we may be able to just ask, you know, what what's going on over there. What, we might be able to get some guidance from that because there were a lot of historic properties. Yeah, but I, but you don't rebuild, you can't rebuild an historic property no. from right. scratch. Yeah. So it would be the ones that are left and it didn't look like Lahaina had sadly very many. No, no yeah, not too many historic. But the, but the uh, banyan tree, uh, an arborist has weighed in and said that they thought the banyan tree, tree was going to bring down. Oh, so good. And again, that was that was that was, that came back with our building official. So. And, I, and I guess my my thought is I just and, and maybe it's I, I, you know totally all all wrong, but I just didn't want to have a situation where um, an RH designation combining is suddenly. Um, yeah. In a historic, and it's all rules are off. You know, you build whatever you want, and and some of the neighborhoods are really challenging because uh, some of the neighbors share a driveway with a, 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 a joint garage in the back. Some of the neighbors have a, a driveway that's right along the edge of their house, and then the garage is in the back. These these are a little narrow 
you know, lots that you would never approve today that if fire was to go through there, how would you, how would you rebuild, you know, those lots? And that, how would, would you still allow a joint driveway with share? In, the, in a historic neighborhood, the answer should be yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the answer should be that's a defining characteristic of, of the historic neighborhood that they, that's what made that fall apart and those places look like the way that they look. And uh, I just think in a, in a historic district, because it is a historic district, we, we just need to have an element, you know, if a disaster happens in a historic district that will kind of, you know, cover, cover that. But, that's and and maybe question. maybe after the fact or something might be like I said the, the way to ad address that. But um, I don't think that this I don't think this this ordinance will address every situation that comes up. And, and we we all clamber on to fire. There are lots of other things. Earthquakes can have some pretty devastating impacts as well. And I think you're right. I think after we see what happens, there's probably going to be some urgency ordinance that comes up behind to assist and rebuild. But to get us to a point where it's even with the smaller yeah. catastrophes that you know, if it's 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 one of your homes um, that 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 goes down. If it's a individual one single structure of fire. Or if it's just, it's a city block, there's a gas main problem or something like that, you know. Um, and I I am I don't know the historic building code, and we would certainly get our, our building official to weigh in on it. But um, I, my recollection is that all the new structures that were legal non-conforming up and found had to be reconstructed with current standards and we made provisions for them to still get through the process expeditiously but um but that's certainly something that we can look into but um because i i i agree and if you have one that goes down and the other doesn't and the reconstruction I don't, I don't think any of us have that answer so and that's a problem because they i mean some of those storage district lots are in West End, and yeah, yeah. Well, you've heard you've heard kind of us banter, so let's. Um, yeah, board members have. Well, I thought your summary here sort of gave some answers on how to handle different situations. So, is this um, not that it's a recommendation, but it, is, it may be a recommendation as to how things are handled based on the circumstances, generally. Um, I think we're going to probably leave it to staff as to determine what they want to move forward in their draft document. But really hoping to get some feedback. And again, you know, it doesn't have to happen today. This is a lot to handle in a day. Um, you can certainly have, well, you got to avoid the, the serial meetings, even on a topic like this. But I know that you can have certain, you can. You can, you can have conversations with co-board members. Um, there are board members, I think we all know, that have a little bit more experience. Um, but again, they can't talk to everybody. Um, and there's a reason for that, right? Education is okay, but influencing is not. So, so but to, to, I mean, there's a reason we have a seven-member board. So I would encourage everybody to think about it. and. Really, look, um, I, I'm happy to send out a couple ordinances like the ADU ordinance that has, that has those, you know, how we got people, the state said, you cannot ask for any additional entitlements, meaning we can't ask for a landmark alteration for a brand new structure in a preservation district if it's an ADU. And so, but we had to make some, you, in order to avoid it, you have to comply with this or do this. Now, I'm going to say, you know, a lot of times we talk about those reports and stuff, but those reports are darn expensive. They start at about $4,000, and that's for the smallest of changes, and they go up from there. So somebody who's willing to do a report like that and get a qualified professional writing that historic analysis, that, that person's willing to make the investment, in my opinion, Generally speaking, okay, there is always going to be the one-offs, but they're willing to make the investment to preserve their neighborhood, right? Um, so those are things that are food for thought for you all. We're looking to you for direction. 
I have a question. So ultimately, what should we be focusing on in terms of um, coming up with uh, a plan or a process that we can submit to the city or wh however it goes, but do you want us to come up with a process to address these issues in historic, if there's a, a disaster in historic neighborhood? Yeah, so what I propose in the presentation is some of the ideas that we have. We would also like for you to weigh in on any type of processing and permitting procedures you would like. Um, this is a great example of offering something to us, <laughs> the attachment from the chair. Um, definitely anything you can think of would definitely be very beneficial. We just do have a very tight deadline, so we're, we'll, we'll be available after words via email or phone call if you have anything that comes up as well. Did we get a copy of your presentation? It's, it's, on, it's, <laughs> it's on your agenda. Oh, I didn't see um, it. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can show you that. And I think just the key to if you, if you touch on the blue presentation, yeah, it comes up. And the key to any comments um, from the board is really going to be, you know, looking at trying to streamline the process and make it easier for folks. You know, I mean, we all saw with the 2017 fires, people just want to get back in their homes, and so they don't want to deal with going through a hillside development process or design review. Mm -hmm. And you know, so to the extent that we can address the concerns of the board and what you guys look at through this process but through a streamlined way that's really kind of what we're hoping to get is there a way that the city can mitigate or i don't know quite how what the wording is for that but say you have a 145 year old building and it burns down um, and you would want to build something else there that's equivalent, not necessarily mimicking the historic building. The codes, the current codes are so different that the expenses just to bring everything to today's code is going to be um, extremely difficult. So I don't know how you deal with that. I think that's covered by homeowners insurance. If I'm like, yeah, the sure. problem is that, that the homeowners insurance doesn't want to pay for all those upgrades. Yeah, and people, people found out some hard lessons. Some people didn't have the clause in their homeowners insurance that would allow for code upgrades. Some people didn't have enough, um, you know, price per square foot to rebuild. Um, that I, I. I I don't know how, I mean, I think that's more of a, an emergency. I don't think that's a city thing. I think that would be a FEMA thing. Yeah, and, right. and homeowners uh, also, people need to realize they have to figure out what the score, what the rebuild is for the square footage for their home. And I tell people all the time, you know, look, if you were to rebuild now, I, my house almost burned in the 2020 fire, the glass fire. Um, six other homes around me did. And you just have to look, what is it? Is it 450 a square foot? Is it 550? Are you gonna want those fancy pillars that are gonna cost, you know, 40,000 a piece? You gotta add all, mm -hmm. all that extra, but people need to be educated about being insured correctly. Right. And that was the big problem with both of those fires. You know, a lot of people were underinsured. Um, so it, it is an issue. Do other cities have, uh, a, you know, do you know what their codes are for the historical district? Have Has that been looked into, um, what, what they're doing? What I can let you know is we're one of the first cities to even have a resilient city ordinance. <laughs> and a couple of cities that happened afterward kind of may have followed ours. <laughs> we were kind of modeling a lot of things that are going to be happening because we were one of the few places that even had a disaster at this level. So yeah, that's true. That's something but, to consider. So, so if, I, if I was to just kind of condense my comments, I would basically, the direction, at least from me, that I would give would be to um, create a process that would expedite the rebuilding of homes by allowing the um, undesignation of historic districts, if deemed, you know, 
necessary based on what was said, or the remapping of a historic district, or the ability to fast track our current major and minor landmark alteration permit processes without compromising the integrity of the historic neighborhood. So that, um, so, because we do have an obligation to those homes that remain in the historic neighborhood. We don't, we don't want to, you know, somebody survived and they got their, you know, little bungalow and now this T111 thing just got built next to it. You know, because it was fast track. So anyway, so that's that would be kind of my. So that would be the if it's fast tracked, it has to adhere to the characteristics. Of well, the yeah, track. or allow allow staff to deem what they feel would be an appropriate process. I think at a minimum, a review by the cultural heritage board at a at, at you know at a, at a minimum of what, what a concept review at. At a minimum, and at a maximum, the full scale, you know, because I know what you're saying with the major land, we got to do the noticing, we got to do it, just it's going to, and with if you have quite a few numbers, um, it could just really well, bog yeah, the so process. Maybe we get rid of the major. Hmm? What did you say? Kathy? We'll get rid of well, the major landmark. Yeah, and I guess what I'd like to keep is the what the elements of the major as far as the, the um, it kind of protects the character defining elements of the neighborhood or it gives an opportunity at least for a review of the board, but maybe get rid of the, all of those other things that, 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 yeah, that, that, that slow it down. A, a so, sign age anyway, yeah. And I'm, I mean, like I said, I'm open for any process that just doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't compromise the, the, the neighborhood, the remaining neighborhood. Are there archives of all the historic buildings? Um, we do have photo record of quite a bit of them. I don't know about every single building, but we do have a drive through survey that was conducted a couple of years ago that have been used during all of the elevator Do the binder still exist somewhere? <laughs> They do, right the by big, my office. The <laughs> They're right by my office. They're right by my office with me while I retire. <laughs> you, you should bring those to a meeting sometime. With a list? And you have. I have one. Yeah. Of <laughs> every house in, in the historic district? In the, the city. surveys that were done yeah. for oh, each. Oh, the surveys. And it has oh, yeah. every. every Pictures? Yeah, yeah of, of the contributing structures. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a lot of uh, um, photo, photographic history at the library. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. Resources. Yeah, of course, yeah. it's a hybrid hot if the library goes, right? So, uh oh, I, um, I'm, I'm just going to throw out food for thought again, again. So, I know there's concern about, you know, some, not that we need to discuss this today, but when you're, when you're putting together your recommendations, and I really hope that, that everybody takes a little bit of time to put together a recommendation. And like Jess, Jessica said, you know, keep an eye on streamlining. We've already seen the council waive all fees. I, I, I'm just going to assume that if it happens again, they're going to do something along those lines. Mm -hmm. But um, the other, but the in the streamlining. But in terms of the care, the, I mean, like if the if the home that burnt down, the the home that vanished, still had surviving neighbors, and we saw that in a lot of neighborhoods, right? <clears throat> either one random house was burned or one random house survived. It was, you know, there's no explanation for it. But what if, you know, if something were there, um, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm thinking of the Burbank Gardens District. If there's uh, all single stories, um, that you, you may not want a double story, a two story coming into the neighborhood. So think about stuff like that that could maybe keep people if they keep the same, you know, again. Roof, if they keep these certain character defining elements, which by the way are listed in our zoning code, we codify them with the downtown station area specific plan in chapter 20, 28, something. And I can go ahead, that's in our preservation district, combining district. I'll go ahead and forward that link to you too. But if if they were not, not rebuilt like a historic building, but still had those like the roof pitch, um, you know, single story, double story, you know, whatever the 
articulation. Um, you know, maybe that's something that could get somebody right past, right past that that um, uh, landmark alteration permit, and save them a ridiculous amount of money on a, um, a, a historic report. And again, that's that's in a situation when the whole house is is gone. Okay, and you you I mean I. I've said you can't, I, my little thing was you can't rebuild history. Um, but that at least keeps it um, compatible. Like like, compatible. Yeah. So, can um, we limit it? Like, we don't want any T111 signing. Well, we already, you know what, we already, and I, I, I you can propose it. Um, you know, I'm, I, you guys, that's. <laughs> I personally would be extremely supportive of that. <laughs> we have it in our design guidelines, no T111, but then I've had people come in and say, oh, T111 doesn't just look like this anymore. I, I, I don't even have the discussion because, you know, there's so, so few people are wanting to use that now. There, people are really going towards cementitious uh, hardy boards and what have you. But, but the other thing to consider, too, in a rebuild is requiring somebody to do, like, um, do you mind? Uh, Chairman, is there letting us know how much you paid per shingle for your home? Well, that's not probably an appropriate example. But okay, well. Yeah, $10, $10 a shingle. Yeah, there. so I mean, it's very, yeah, but, and there's, they're beautiful shingles, but shingles um, like for like, you may have similar, right? It's kind of like wood windows. You can't find wood windows unless you go to a restoration. Right, but the board has given us the ability to approve wood windows that are modern wood windows, double pane and the like, all around the home if the, or if the um, owners want to do that. So. And again, I like to say, I, I think if um, in, in your draft report, if, 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 if probably what I'm hearing, at least at a minimum, a concept review process, you know, at least have a concept review. I think the board really would like to see in concept. We may not be in a position because of the emergency and everything to be in a decision making position, but at least we could get feedback and uh, then whoever the entity, whether it be the zoning administrator or whatever, could take that feedback and, and go from there. And in reality, it's it's a good possibility it's going to be a, a, a hired contractor, a consulting agent. I mean, that's what happened with it. It may not even be your office, your people, that the feedback goes back to. So well, maybe a clause that requires that individual to have a certain qualification. Well, there is another thought. Um, no, I think that's a good idea. I think that if, if it is a historic district, that we try to keep it away from a group of contractors that are brought in. Mm -hmm. To handle a situation like Coffee Park, mm -hmm. um, because Coffee Park to me isn't isn't great. So I, mean, I think you can go down co uh, any street in Coffee Park and go underinsured, overinsured, underinsured, yeah. underinsured, <laughs> overinsured, <laughs> and you can literally look at it and go, okay, these people, you know, did really great on their insurance, and these people were screwed. And I think you can do that in, in preservation districts yeah. too. You can see where there yeah, was absolutely. workforce and there were the, the people that had more money. But and, and just to, for clarification, it wasn't um, the, the contractors did the rebuild, but we hired people to do um, the plan check, mm -hmm. and that is where that's where it's going to get approved. Yeah. I mean, that's where the materials are called out. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, again, I'm throwing out suggestions, but I. I'm hoping that all of you can there be something that, that that's being done by a city a city actual employee rather than subcontractor well, to approve yeah. within a designated district. Yeah, I just wanted to give some background on the data for that. So we were able to pull a report for all the tubs and nun fire parcels that were affected or designated RC. So just for tons and nuns fire, those were two thousand six hundred and forty four parcels. And from twenty eighteen to now we've had two thousand building permits. Final. So that's quite a significant amount. So I want you to think about that number when you're thinking of recommendations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing to think about is yes, they were contract folks that were, you know, doing a lot of these reviews. Um, but, you know, they had qualified planners in there and they were working under the direct supervision of our city staff members. So they were not doing anything 
that wasn't in you know direct line with the provisions and the direction given by city staff and i'm not aware of any city staff that have the qualifications that you're looking for I didn't hear what you said. I'm not aware of any city or city staff that have the qualifications that you're looking for. I'm not qualified to write a uh, well, I was just going to suggest that staff to the Cultural Heritage Board should probably be in charge of the rebuilding <laughs> in the historic neighborhoods. No, no, that's a question. <laughs> uh, other comments? Patrick? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, that what, what Susie was talking about is someone's going to build something that is within the characters that, that we can outline in these preservation districts, then they should be streamlined past any review that we have, or maybe not, I mean, I'd like to say any review, but it, it, who's then who's making the decision, I guess, is kind of what, you, what we're all a little bit hung up on, but, um, but I think that's absolutely, and if someone wants to do a rebuild of close to what kind of what was there or something, you know, something along those lines, and it should absolutely just Yeah, might not right be in. concept review. Yeah. Like a repair mm -hmm. to what was there, mm -hmm. a rebuild to what what was there. Well, now, I'm, my understanding is that a rebuild, a repair to what was there, okay, yeah. but a, a rebuild to what was there, I, my read of the Secretary of State's okay, yeah, 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 not to mimic, but to be compared to remain compatible and, and with those, you know, those character defining elements again, yeah. with the driveway, depth of front yard, white or you know, three foot fence in the front yard. Those and those are all listed. Those were approved by the Cultural Heritage Board. We used to know it as Resolution Two Hundred Nine, and we finally codified it. So, and Mark Bacher was thrilled. Yeah, I was going to say Mark <laughs> yeah. took the lead on that. Yeah. Yeah. Is so, it true that some of those houses that were rebuilt, like Coffee Park, those neighborhoods, and they had the plans as they were built to begin with, got streamlined to be rebuilt on those previous plans? They were, except they had to be brought up to current standards. Okay. So where we were, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can answer. Yeah. Um, this was also like a previous question too about um, reconstructing things the way they were in historically. Um, we do have provisions for uh, non-conforming structures and uses, so we did allow them to do generally the same thing as long as they're up to current building and fire code, but it still allowed quite a few things to be as they were as long as they rebuilt in a certain timeline. Um, yeah. <laughs> Would that dictate yeah. what, materi what materials they use in the current um, it depends on what the building and fire requirements are, but they might allow it to continue. And there's been some indigestion over shingle, shingles, um, and also, and certainly shingle roof. I, I, that's my oh, understanding. And as oh, 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 porches, decks, um, yeah. vents in the home. There's a lot of new fire that they, and also uh, interior sprinkler systems. Yeah, and that was a big upgrade. Um, there's also a trigger for some of these things. So when things were brought down to staff level review for Hillside, um, if they expanded over 10% of the original building footprint, or if they were doing more visual changes or environmental changes, that would bring it back up to the zoning administrator level. But other than that, it was kept at staff level if it was like generally similar to the original building. I, I know you're under a tight time frame, but just as you did a category at Hillside, is there possible to just throw something in that category of historic neighborhoods? Yeah, we're already planning to do okay. that. <laughs> yeah. All right. I guess one of the things that, that when we talk about bringing something back, some of these districts didn't become districts until what, 2000? Yeah, Ridgeway. 2000. Ridgeway. 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 Yeah. Ridgeway. I mean, so a lot of these homes started out as historic, and then over the years they were. You know, when we talk about bringing them back, you know, my house is one of those awful play houses that I had um, right before we went historic. My owner, the owner that I bought it from, put T111 up and took out all of that wonderful signing and took it all down. And so, you know, in, in a situation like that, and like the, the property that we had a few weeks ago, that had a different siding, and then they're saying now that it's a different siding. 
you know, I think that some of that is going to need a little bit of uh, guide, guidance and oh, some oh, kind of, you know, maybe yeah. with concept review, which concept repairs, review or yeah. something. Yeah, repairs, or if it is, you know, having to replace all, you know, the whole, all the siding and stuff. But what was the siding? What would, would have been the siding in, in the day? I don't know that we could use a catastrophe to require people to restore. I no, think I if it was restore. legal non-conforming, they would be given the ability to go back with the legal non-conforming, which is, you know, the whatever, if, uh, I'm assuming the, the person who owned your home in advance, hopefully they had building permits to do that work, but if not, you need to know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. But but yeah, so le so if it's legal non conforming, but there's the benefit of it coming to the board on a concept review basis. Mm -hmm. So the board I mean, because a restoration process, if if I'm gonna use your house again as an example, if the if the fire a fire started at your neighbor's house mm -hmm. and spread over and took out that wall, um, it's you know you've got to reconstruct your wall. The benefit you know if you're if you're somebody who doesn't understand what the preservation district is about, the benefit of coming to the board for concept is that you get that education. There are a lot of people who are going to come just because it's required and say oh, I got my plans already and this is what I'm doing exactly what was there before. So, but there are others that will say wow that that sounds like a really cool plan and it preserves the district and, and it makes my house worth more money. So. Um, so anyway, so that's just again food for thought. But I don't think that we could require a, anything that was legally constructed, legal non-conforming, which, by the way, includes quite a few of those narrow driveway structures, right? And those are the ones I I don't know that they could be reconstructed in the exact footprint. I would have that we would have to defer to the building. You you almost you? have to let them because there are lots that that. Yeah, lot lines that are part of the city now, and I, people own them. I would just have to. I would have to defer to our building division on that. I do not know the answer. I'm, I'm trying to remember that, and I may be wrong, but I think the cultural area board does have the ability to um, adjust um, setbacks. setbacks. Yeah, I think right? that's in, limited in, in historic neighborhoods. So again, there could be opportunity. But yeah, so the, so the difference the difference is setback is a is a zoning code uh, district design standard, whereas you've got the building code that requires certain access and what have you. So that's why yeah. I just yeah. if it's building code, the cultural heritage board might, at least not that I'm aware of. I don't think any board can yeah. supersede that. No, no. you so just have to let that process. Go. Yeah. yeah. Well, trying to you know maybe think about trying to wrap this up. Let's kind of move towards final comments for staff. I have one more question to throw in there. I'm still worried about the standalone historic buildings like the post office. And um, they're a, a, a fairly large, the, the Church of One Tree. Mm -hmm. um, there is a large group of standalone buildings. And how do we handle them? Yeah, some designated and some undesignated. That's, yeah, right. But I mean, there are not. I mean, the Church of One Tree is designated. The post office is designated. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There are properties all over the, the city and, and designated and unincorporated. Absent uh, so the major disaster, if they just burned down for whatever reason, just a one-off. What would be the? the, the well, if they burned down, you wouldn't replace them. But if they're mm -hmm. damaged. Mm -hmm. This, this, this. Um, I think is this ordinance intended to go for the one-offs as well as the yes. Yeah, yeah. it is intended. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. if it's if it's designated and you know it has that, if it's designated, it has the dash H, right? Even if it's not in a district, and so then if it's damaged and they want to do repairs, it would need to follow the landmark alteration process. So then we don't have to separate those two just that yeah. way and just still fall into. Everything we can to protect the cotton town sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about the flamingo? <laughs> hey, I like the flamingo sign. <laughs> yeah, just saying. That's cute. <laughs>
um, I would also like to say we don't. This doesn't have to be like perfect. <laughs> I would want you to know that both resiliency ordinances were updated around twelve times since twenty seventeen. So just know <laughs> it will probably be changed for anything that happens along. So when do the you way. want us to have this ready? Like at our next board meeting? No, it's. Going. Well, that's next week, right? Yeah, next we're, week. we're not seeing it again. So we need to decide today. No. But we're just providing comments today. And then if you have additional comments that you think of, you can email oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Kristen. So you're going to take our comments today? Yes, we're taking your okay. comments today. And if there are, you know, if you have additional comments that you want to email to Christian, we would gladly take those. Um, just for Christian sanity, if you could have that by your next meeting next week, that would be lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but would, um, would it be possible to see the draft prior to the planning commission meeting? At this point, well, uh, we can't provide it prior to the planning commission receiving okay. it. So yeah. So, it would, but it would be posted the week before. For the agenda. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. we'd always see it at that time. Yeah. yeah. And so the board can definitely provide comments on that, um, okay. that, you know, staff can take a look at. It. And, you know, if we could get those prior to the meeting, then we can take a look at it and be able to provide any response to the commission. Okay. Well, so, wouldn't you think this is pretty darn good? So thank you. It's just food for thought. Yeah. It's, yeah. And so they'll, I heard, I heard from a few, but not all, that there was some some support for dropping down to concept in, or, in an effort to expedite mm -hmm. concept review and and then go for either director level or or um, zoning administrator level. Yeah. So was mm -hmm. did I hear that? Yeah, or so, even a someone that's been specially assigned. For, to to it that has, you know, those kind of qualifications to um, to, to deal with the historic structures and the historic districts. Somebody that has that eye for for that. Yeah, yeah but it could be a number of yeah. of board members that do it. No. It would be somebody on somebody staff. staff. Other comments? Final comments? I only have one more, which I think that uh, Brian's dead on as far as if, if there is a, such a total loss, then it should just, it should lose the start designation right. entirely on that, then it becomes, you know, really good. Yeah. Yeah, and the quicker you can make that happen, the quicker it would be yeah. able to just roll into. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you still don't think there should be like, well, if 25% is ruined, a have to comply with how those buildings were. If it's 50% ruined, then it's not a historical building. Should there be, you know, still I mean, certain amounts? It seems to be so hard to tell. Maybe half of it got burned entirely, and that half goes away entirely, and the rest remains. You know, I mean, it, it seems yeah, it, like it would be so. See, yeah, it's going to it's going to require a survey. That's yeah. what it's going to require a legitimate survey there. Yeah. I hope we don't see that in our lifetime. Yeah. <laughs> Other thoughts or comments? I'm going to go ahead and open this up then for public comment. Yes, we don't have any attendees via Zoom and nobody in person. <laughs> so I'll close the public comment period. And any last final thoughts? I'll call for adjournment then. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.